Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the IBS Freedom Podcast. I am Amy Holland Cambar D. And as always, I have Dr. Nikita Deneza with us today. And we also have a very special guest. Jennifer Fugo is here. She is awesome. She, we're going to talk all about the skin gut connection, which we haven't thus far. So I'm super pumped to talk about that. And just a little background on Jennifer. So Jennifer is a clinical nutritionist empowering adults who've been failed by conventional medicine to beat chronic skin and unending gut challenges. She has experience working with conditions such as eczema, psoriasis, rosacea, dandruff, and hives, with clientele ranging from regular folks to celebrities plus professional athletes. Jennifer also founded her own line of skincare and supplements available at quillshop.com. Is that correct? Quellshop. Quellshop.com. Awesome. Specifically for people struggling with chronic skin issues. Um, so I can't wait to talk about that because there seems to be a gap in the market for products specifically for skin issues. She holds a master's degree in human nutrition from the University of Bridgeport and is licensed is a licensed diet a licensed nutritionist and certified nutrition specialist. Her work has been featured on Dr. Oz, Reuters, Yahoo, CNN, and many podcasts and summits. Jennifer is a faculty mem- faculty member of Learn Skin Platform an Amazon best-selling author and the host of the Healthy Skin Show, which is an amazing podcast. So if you have skin issues, check out her podcast because it's such a wealth of knowledge and specifically the skin, specific skin issues, which there's not really many resources out there. So I'm so happy to have you that we can talk about all the, the gut skin stuff and just skin stuff in general because it's something that I know is often present with many of my clients and i'm sure it's the same for you Nikki, too mm-hmm. well, yeah, thank so, you so much for having me i appreciate it yeah i'm so pumped i think like first and foremost i know i feel like i have a little bit of knowledge on how you got into the skin game i, I know you had some personal experience with some skin issues so i think to start could you tell us a little bit about why you decided to specialize in this area? In all honesty, like most people, um, and, and like you, Amy, because you struggled with SIBO and that's what got you interested in this. And, and I'm glad, grateful to know your story. Um, but for me, I really had eczema. That was honestly what had started me down this route. I had for a number of years had GI issues, lots of diarrhea, gas, bloating, like gas that like would clear a room. I'm going to be honest. Let's just like put it out there right now. So like all the embarrassment is gone. Like we can just talk about things like you. I'm sure you ladies do here on your show. And um, for me, I had I felt like I had addressed the gut issues. But when I was in grad school, I started to have eczema pop up on my hands. And it's a very specific type of eczema called dyshydroidic eczema. So it's essentially where you get these like almost clear looking beads that form under your skin. And it usually impacts the palms of the hands and the bottoms of the feet. And so for me, this was on the palms of my hands and started on my right hand, my middle finger. You know, I was just like, wow, right? right. <laughs> there's irony to this. I don't know yeah. what it is, but it's not feeling too good. And so basically what happens is um, the skin becomes incredibly itchy. It starts to burn. It becomes red. The beads will eventually burst. And it is just one of the most, I mean, anyone who's been in a really serious rash type flare knows how hellish it essentially is because this is like there is no soothing that level of itch and burn and pain that can come with this. And then eventually the skin would start to calm down and the skin would heal over. It would kind of start to dry out a bit and then it would look nice for a few days and this whole process would start. And it's just this vicious horrible cycle. So in the summertime, because I live where there is four seasons, it was this constant problem um, in the summertime just of, of, the, of the the beads, they burst, go through this flare cycle and whatnot. In the wintertime, it was a different story. The skin would dry out so badly. And that would be across like my entire palms where anytime I bent my fingers or went to grab something, the, the areas where, you know, we have lines and whatnot would split. 
And so I had these like basically paper cuts that felt like self-induced essentially. And so it didn't matter like what season it was. I basically had to stop washing my hands, which like in this day and age feels like, you know, (laughs) I, I have so much sympathy for people who have hand rashes right now and for going through everything that we've gone through in the last year and a half, because you really can't wash your hands like we're told to um water would burn i couldn't even do soap so just water alone would burn um it would cause everything to get worse and more irritated i couldn't wash my hair i tried with gloves but gloves i can tell you no matter how much they tell you they're tight and they're not they're not going to fill up with water they do um i had to stop going to the gym um because i couldn't wash my hands and i couldn't handle like barbells because it Mm. would dig into the skin um i had to give up my i used to um volunteer at a for a um, cat um, shelter, basically. Like, I have cats. So I used to like to donate my time and clean out their cages and stuff. I couldn't do that. I was constantly walking around with, like, these blue gloves that I got from Home Depot. And people were like, why are you wearing gloves? Like, what's up with that? And what's wrong with your skin? Are you using the wrong soap? Do you not know how to moisturize? Like, they just don't understand. They ask questions that eventually you're just like, stop asking me questions. I don't want to answer questions because you don't understand. You don't get it. Leave me alone. And so eventually this whole thing got to the point where I was almost about to quit my master's because I thought to myself, if I can't figure this out and this is getting this bad, I can't handle food. I had to stop teaching cooking classes because I was doing that beforehand. And nobody wants, let me tell you, no one wants to eat your food when your hands look like a wreck. And a lot of times they don't want to shake your hand either because they think you have something that's contagious. So mm. this this feeling of, of people being kind of revolted by what was happening on my hands got really got to me. It was very depressing. And eventually my husband's like, hey, why don't you try and look at this from a perspective of like if you were your client, what would you tell them to do? And so that was sort of the beginning of piecing together and cobble, maybe more the term is cobbling together a a protocol. (laughs) I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no testing. I had no guidance. I read a lot of stuff on the internet. Um, I tried natural stuff. I even was using some topical steroid to keep things under control. And about after... I guess it was about six months, the flares started to diminish. Um, At about eight months, the skin was starting to finally heal up. And it was around the 12-month mark where my nails, because my nails had become quite damaged, began to grow out looking normal. And I was really happy about that. And so the reason that I started this isn't because of what happened to me. It's because I went through, got to the other side, But I was still in Facebook groups for eczema and psoriasis and all these other rashes. And I saw their pictures and the cries for help and saying how frustrated they were with just like doing different diet changes. And they were fed up with their doctor and all of these things. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe there's something that I can offer to these people. Like I don't, I'm good, but I don't want to leave them behind. And that was really the moment where... I stopped caring as much about the topics that I focused on before this because I I've been um, I've been in the online kind of like integrative space since 2009 and just focused my energy toward helping these individuals. I started the Healthy Skin Show, which is entirely dedicated to this exact topic, and um, I launched a website called Skin Interrupt. Yeah, no, I'm so glad that you shared your story, and I think that one thing that's struck out to me is that there it feels like you aren't able to connect as well to others when you have some of these skin issues like it feels very disconnecting and I think sometimes in the gut health space if you're having a lot of gut symptoms it's similar but different for sure and we were just having a conversation with a a previous guest about how connection is so key to like nervous system balance and overall health and if you're not able to connect in a way that's, that's very, you're in a present moment. I think that's so tough. And to not feel like you're getting support, uh, the proper support from both conventional and even some of like the well-meaning functional practitioners that might be putting them on all all sorts of elimination diets and things like that must be super challenging. 
It is. Um, I mean, it's also hard because you, there's a lot of judgment when right. it's very obvious. You know, I think, I think people with gut issues can certainly relate because there's a lot of judgment from others about what they're eating, what they're not eating. Yeah. You know, like, why are you eating that? Why aren't you eating that? Well, that's, I can eat that. No problem. The same happens to people with skin issues because they do walk a lot of times down that uh, kind of somewhat dangerous path of starting to eliminate food when they get fed up at the dermatologist's office. Mm -hmm. But for most people with rashes, with the exception of those who have them where they're easily hot, hidden under clothes, like yeah. say um, in the groin area, um, you know, that's one yeah. easy spot where you could relatively easily hide things. But like when it's your hands, when it's your face, when it's areas that caught that really you can't hide. It right. does. People stare. People want to know what's wrong. Everybody's got an opinion. They tell you literally, you don't know. Are you using the wrong soap? Do you, maybe you need to change moisturizers. Like I heard that so much. I got to the point I wanted to just scream at people. Like I I just did not want to be, and that maybe that was part of it too. I didn't want to be around people. I didn't want yeah. the stares. I didn't want to feel rejected. I literally had people, when they would go to shake my hand, you could see they'd be like kind of, all, there's this moment where they're like trying to figure out if they can bail out and they would like pull their hand back and be like, oh, you're not know, like trying to, because they didn't want to touch my hand. And I yeah. get it, but it doesn't hurt. It, or it, it, it doesn't not hurt because you understand why. And their, their confusion and concern that maybe you have something contagious on your hands. Um, and so the shame, the frustration, I mean, sometimes it was incredibly painful. I remember being at a retreat and I had to wear like cotton gloves. I mean, I'd gone to Boston. It was the fall. So it on the train ride up to Boston where the air completely dried out, my hands just cracked everywhere. And so I had to keep putting on the salve and wearing like the cotton white gloves all day. And everybody had an opinion of what I should and shouldn't be doing. And right. it was really awful. I couldn't hold my backpack and my handbag to get around. Like you don't, you take for granted all the things that you do until the moment when you can't do it anymore. And I feel for people who end up with like cracks in their heels and, I mean, some of the wounds and issues that I see and hear about, or even like women who are breastfeeding who, where they're like, their nipples are impacted by the rashes. And that's really, Ugh. really painful. Oh um, I've worked with clients that have it in the whole groin and genital area. And a lot of things are compromised as a result of that. Some people have get to the point where their rashes are so bad that they can no longer work and they're really debilitated. So it, it does span the gamut. It's not just like, oh, I have a little rash. I'll put, spray some Windex on it, right? The whole like <laughs> my big fat great wedding like solution of just put a little Windex, you'll be fine. No, like, you know, I understand that the traditional way of looking at this is applying steroid cream. And I was recommended that. And I did use some topical steroid creams. And then you can get into more serious medications like biologics and immunosuppressants and whatnot. But um, I just want for somebody listening to this, just know that there are answers out there. It may take a while once you figure out what exactly is going on in terms of like a root cause, like why is this happening? Um, but there are answers and there are ways. I never want to make the promise or guarantee that somebody's going to be like absolutely 100% better. Like, have I had flare ups again in the past? Yes, absolutely, I have. Um, but I use my skin now as a barometer to know if something's really off and I need to look deeper. Um, but there are answers. It just takes time. And you have to, if if you've gotten this far and you're like, you know what, I don't want to spend the rest of my life this way, then maybe for you, if you're really curious as to why and you want to address those reasons why, there are resources out there. And that's what, you know, again, that's why I started the Healthy Skin Show. And I'm curious to go back to the conversation of root causes. And this is probably opening up mm -hmm. a whole can of worms, but what are some of the most common root causes that you're seeing in your patients with, say, eczema? And then maybe we can kind of have have the same conversation, but with some of the other conditions like rosacea and psoriasis. But let's start with eczema since that's what you had. Um, what are some of the things that you see very commonly with the people yeah. you work with? Yeah. So in terms of eczema, so I actually, I want to be clear, and I think this is what you're asking is a great question, but it's one of the big mistakes that people make thinking that their particular skin rash condition 
means that they are special (laughs) and that it's different. There are certain things that can happen in like psoriasis, like um, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease and whatnot that won't show up in eczema, but it's because I think of some of the issues, other underlying issues that are going on. But generally speaking, across the board, there is a combo of 16 root causes and every person, regardless of what their diagnosis is or what type of eczema or type of psoriasis or type of rosacea or a dandruff or whatever, they all have some combination, anywhere from three to maybe five or six of these different things. And I can run through them very quickly. Mm-hmm. And then I'm happy to talk about the more like kind of specifics. But in in general, every single case, for the most part, like 95%, all has some level of microbiome dysbiosis and mm-hmm. liver detox um, challenges going on. So the 16 are this microbiome dysbiosis, but with skin issues, that obviously is going on in likely the gut, but also with the level of the skin as well. And sometimes we can even have hidden infections. So for example, you could have a parasitic infection that is not at the skin level of the skin and not at the level of the gut either. It could, you, parasites move. Um, so I just want to be clear that there are some slight variations to this. But gut dysfunction is another one. Diet and food reactions are certainly one that shouldn't be ignored, but they're not like mm-hmm. the main thing. Nutritional deficiencies trauma, unmanaged stress. There's genetic implications specifically with a gene called filaggrin. Um, It's sort of like the mortar mix between your skin cells. Uh, There's thyroid Mm. dysfunction, hormone imbalances, things like estrogen dominance, um, Mm. insulin resistance. Uh, There can be autoimmunity. Sometimes um, there can be drug reactions that have actually triggered the skin rash issues. Um, mitochondrial dysfunction, heavy metal toxicity, environmental toxins, and environmental allergies. So in terms of eczema, um, for sure, there's usually some sort of microbiome dysbiosis issue going on. There's typically always a liver detoxification challenge going on. And then it just depends. Sometimes there's thyroid issues. There's usually nutrient deficiencies. Um, and then sometimes there are mitochondrial dysfunction, but like there can be, you know, again, there could be somebody who has a really serious history of, you know, assault or some really traumatic incident that sort of set their system up to function or operate in a different way. And it's interesting, the more I read about trauma, it does rewire your stress response in a way that is, can be with time can be catastrophic to the system, not just from like a mental health standpoint, but just Mm -hmm. from like the whole adrenal um, flight or flight mechanism. So that's what I want to, I do want to stress. So Mm -hmm. eczema is interesting in that it can also have a histamine overload piece. For some people, Mm -hmm. that's very true, especially if they have a lot of pollen allergies. They find that they're really sensitive to high histamine foods and whatnot. Whereas psoriasis, for example, there's typically almost always an underlying microbiome problem. There's sometimes gut dysfunction, sometimes not. Um, There's always liver detox challenges, but those can sometimes also be more significant and may require more intervention down the road Mm -hmm. where like in that particular instance, a liver detox would be helpful, but I never recommend liver detoxes because oftentimes they make skin rash issues worse from the get-go. So I I, I prefer to support the biochemical pathways nutritionally. Um, And then also to looking at inflammatory issues, because for psoriasis, inflammation is a huge piece. The thyroid also, you always have to check your thyroid with psoriasis because they go hand in hand. And there's been a number of cases I've worked on where, and actually one woman who is my client, her TSH was at 33 And no one had ever told her to get her thyroid checked. I was the first person. And as soon as I saw the results, I was like, you need to go see an endocrinologist like, like, you know, five weeks ago. Like, (laughs) this is urgent. Um, With rosacea, um, there's there usually is some gut challenges present um, in the microbiome. There's a pretty high incidence of SIBO. And Amy and I actually talked about this on the Healthy Skin Show. There's a lot of research 
pointing toward um, hidden SIBO and something to the effect like about 77% of rosacea cases actually have SIBO under the surface. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times too, they're very sensitive to histamine releasing foods, hot foods. Like I've had to tell rosacea clients, they're like, oh, I'm drinking this great ginger tea. I'm like, no, no ginger. No ginger for you because that actually makes things worse. So you have to be a little careful. There are food triggers with that. Um, and with dandruff, the the one of the main concerns for me is the the confusion that happens in the system with fungal organisms. So dandruff is the hallmark is that you're they tell well they say the conventional wisdom is that you too much malassezia, which is a fungus that should be in the skin microbiome. The reality is your body's attacking it. And so usually it starts attacking it because it's become sensitized to fungal organisms internally. And now it's trying to protect you and it just ends up out dealing with it on the skin in the areas where malassezia tends to live. This is not my theory, by the way. This is actually from Dr. Datner. Um, he is a dermatologist and immunologist who actually has retired. And I did have him on the Healthy Skin Show to talk about that. Um, but I have found that to be the case, though fungal issues usually are not the only problem going on. Mm. So don't run out and go do a candida cleanse because you have dandruff. That might not solve it. Again, it's complicated. That's the point. It's complicated. Yeah. And you really do need to understand what your root causes are in order to make a dent. Otherwise, you are going to feel like you're spinning your wheels, not getting anywhere. Well, and even with each of the things that you rattled off, like it, you don't stop at, oh, you have candida, mystery solved. Okay, cool. Do a candida cleanse. It's like, well, why did you get candida? Right? Like you should have protective mechanisms in place that keep candida at bay. So yeah, same thing for SIBO. Like, why did you get SIBO? It's not like your body just decided to get SIBO for the fun of it. Like there had to have been a breakdown in motility or digestive juices or something that happened to lead to that. So even like the root causes oftentimes have roots that go a bit deeper um, with maybe I, I could see one that would be really simple. Like, oh, if you have mer mercury toxicity because you, I don't even know, like, drank a tube of mercury like that's pretty linear or you know if, if you got exposed to arsenic because you like work in a lab that deals with arsenic like that's pretty linear and then you identified the root cause in that case but aside from something like that most of these root causes have deeper roots that mm -hmm. then you want to continue questioning to really get to the good healing you know Absolutely. And I, I also think the other point to be made here is that skin issues take way longer to improve than gut issues do, just mm. for everybody listening. So you don't get frustrated and you're like, well, my gut's a lot better now. I'm pooping like a champ and I don't have any gas or bloating, mm. but why is my skin still a mess? Unfortunately, I look at the skin, I kind of like take the skin that's the barometer that trumps them all. And so a lot of times clients will notice this huge improvement in other areas, but they're like, but my skin is like a little better. And I'm like, we have to keep going. And mm. so that's, if I can, if that's the one piece of advice that most of my clients at the end, I'm like, what did you wish you knew? Or what mindset did you wish you had at the beginning of this journey? They're like, it's going to take way more time than you are thinking because hmm. the gut issues improve oftentimes much sooner than, and a lot of other issues will improve much sooner hmm. than the skin will. That's really good to know. Um, because I, I do think that skin, you know, your skin could be really aggravated on a Tuesday and then the next day it's a bit better. And then the next day it's really pissed off. So I think that there is this believe and with myself included that, oh, it, the skin is really responsive, so it'll heal really quickly. Um, but that's good to know that that's not generally going to be the case with maybe with something this like deeply ingrained and this persistent, it'll take more time to really right the ship. Um, I would say nails and hair also take mm -hmm. a wicked long time to really see improvements in those because they grow so slowly. You know, and your what toenails, is it? your toenails are even slower than your fingernails. Yeah. 
yeah, so those those tissues could take potentially years to really see. I just had that conversation with a patient earlier this week. She was saying that her nails um, weren't really improving yet. And I was like, oh, sweetie, but they grow so slow. Like you, it's going to yeah. take a lot of patience on both of our parts um, as we watch those because they grow, what, like a millimeter per week or something? It's something really quite slow. It is. It is. And the other thing, actually, I'd, I'd love to mention quickly, too, is that if you do have skin issues, it's really important to chart the cycle of your flares. I know it sounds mm. weird, but like when does the onset happen? And so you for women who are menstruating, you do have to take that into account because some women like, for example, if estrogen is an issue, you're going to usually notice that things will get worse between days 12 and 16 of your cycle. And then, mm -hmm. of course, there's sort of that cyclical monthly issue where in a parasitic case, you might notice that once a month there seems to be this horrific flare up and that could also be a sign of parasites um also to some people become and it's not common but some women become sensitized to their progesterone developing essentially an allergy to it yeah. and so i have worked in a couple of cases um of that it's really tricky it's very those are very difficult cases so again charting your cycle just the cycle of the flares and then overlaying that consideration, like if you're a menstruating woman, like where am I in my mens yep. menstrual cycle? And then in general, like is there a monthly pattern to this um, can be really helpful. Yeah. And it's interesting you bring that up because I had one client that had that progesterone. It's like autoimmune. It's mm -hmm. kind of autoimmune Correct. in nature, right? I think there there is a doctor here in Cincinnati that specializes in it. So randomly, um, this client, we like, she was going to go see this doctor. It was really interesting, but, um, yeah, that's an, I think a really hard issue to get diagnosed when it, and it's a little bit more rare, right? Or do we know? I mean, I, I think it's a very, it's a very uncommon thing. I've only okay. heard from over the last three years, maybe four or five women who've struggled yeah. with this. So it's not very common, but then again, the truth of the matter is, a lot of times people are just handed steroid creams and nobody right. looks any deeper. So right. unless the True. the person, the patient really persists in getting answers, there may be people out there who are going undiagnosed who are struggling with this. Hmm. Right. And, and I wanted to bring up a point too. I mean, you had mentioned it earlier, like trauma and, you know, the stress response being rewired. I think it's, it's a lot easier at times to blame food for skin issues than to look deeper at like potentially trauma and you know the stress in our lives whether it's like a job we hate or like our relationship is toxic that we're in or whatever it is that might be driving some of that trauma so i'm really glad that you brought that up because i do think it's just such a key point to not to search different angles. It's not just a food situation. You have to really dig deeper. And some of these things that you wouldn't think to be really strongly connected can be. Mm -hmm. And and actually, um, the reason that I started to look way outside of food was because when I, so when I had eczema, I had been gluten-free, dairy-free, and egg-free for six years. And those are like the first three things that everybody pretty much is told to avoid when they have I don't know, so many different conditions, but especially with like eczema, the eggs thing, oh, eggs are bad for eczema. Well, I can tell you there's there's plenty of people who can tolerate eggs who have yeah. eczema. Um, dairy does not necessarily cause a flare in every single person, nor does gluten actually. Um, mm. But I had already removed so much food. I was eating a pretty clean diet. And so it didn't make sense to me. And or maybe it was somewhat of stubbornness of just having had to do that for so many years. I was not taking anything else out. And what's heartbreaking to me is seeing the amount of people in like Facebook groups who are struggling with skin issues. Cause I'm in there, but I'm, I'm kind of quiet and I have to be because there's a lot of rules around what you as a practitioner can yeah. and cannot say, and they will very quickly kick you out. <laughs> so yeah. I kind of, unfortunately, like I can sometimes be like, Oh, 
you know, good job or have you looked at this? But like I have to be unfortunately very quiet because of the way these Facebook groups are set up. And um, it's heartbreaking to see not only people who are so fed up, they get to a point where they're so fed up, they've tried AIP, they've tried low salicylate, low amine diets, low nickel diets, all these different things. And at that point, they're so frustrated. They don't know what to eat. They're eating such limited diets. Um, it is, it's, it's actually gotten to a point where it's really scary for me because I have had some clients who've ended up hospitalized due to the significant level of nutrient depletions that have happened solely as a result of the orthorexic situation going on where they are so afraid of every food because they've been repeatedly told in Facebook groups and in some of these diet books specific for skin issues that it's just food. Just keep taking out this. Just keep yeah. taking out this. And I almost get mad. I'm like, you know, I don't understand why, and I'm just throwing out a name here, why Susie can go into a Facebook group and make a recommendation for someone to take out all these foods from their diet. But if I did that, I yeah. would get kicked out of the group because I'm a practitioner giving advice. And I'm like, you know, it's it's unfair because I'm now having to undo the, the yeah. trauma that has resulted from people taking way too many foods out or believing that if they just keep their diet uber controlled, that will somehow be enough to keep their flares and that's good enough. And that makes yep. me really, really sad. I think because hybrid who- between sad and mad for me. Yeah. But yeah, it, it it's funny you say that because I literally just like scheduled an Instagram post for this weekend. And all it says on the image is restrictive diets don't heal guts. And then I went into that and it's like, it like, I, I mean, is it beneficial to eliminate trigger foods? Absolutely. I have celiac disease. So like, yeah, I have to avoid gluten, but will eliminating a food alone actually heal you like i i would say 99 percent of people need to add something whether it's like self-care or connection with other people or nutrition calories vitamins nutri- like you need to add something to facilitate the healing process removal is never going to do it alone or it's very rare that you really get what i would call true bona fide healing out of just eliminating shit and, I, and we know that because so many of our patients and clients have gone down that rabbit hole of, oh, there's a, there's just one mystery evil food. And when I find it, yeah. everything will miraculously poof and be gone. And it's this really crappy, never ending quest that never really comes to fruition because it, it's like you get so zoomed in on that goal. And so laser focused on the elimination that it's almost like you don't have the capacity, you don't have the energy and the wherewithal, and you don't have the awareness to look at other things like trauma and sleep and nutrients mm-hmm. and calories or whatever else it might be. Um, yeah. I'll but- actually add to that. I uh, just this week had a client who she's she did get tested for celiac disease. They're sort of like mm-hmm. on the fence feeling like it's inconclusive, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. Um, but she had been told because of the, I believe she has eczema. Um, she was repeatedly told over and over again through the years that she should just avoid dairy. The dairy was really bad for her. She was, uh, I forget what else she may have been avoiding, but we, when she got her stool test results back and my goodness, were they like a total wreck? And, and listen, she was, she was, she was like overwhelmed, but yet grateful to finally have some answers. Yeah. She had two parasites. She had cryptosporidium and giardia. She had Ooh. high H pylori. She had overgrowth patterns. She had uh, so many op- like very high opportunistic bad bacteria in her GI tract. And I'm like, so this whole time, people have just been beating this drum to death that you have to avoid dairy to fix your skin, which did not work. And yet nobody ever mentioned to you to look any deeper because this stuff has just been, I mean, her doctor was even really fascinated by the test. She's like, whoa, this is comprehensive. I, I you know, I didn't even think to like look for any of these. So that's I, I work with a lot of people like that and they're honestly so relieved when I say I want you to start reintroducing foods. I don't want you to take foods out because yep. 
the damage that this war that we create unnecessarily between ourselves and food and this quest for perfect health is so damaging. I would say mm-hmm. it's equally damaging to, you know, for you, like as, as someone who has celiac disease, I would argue that gluten is just as damaging as is an orthorexic mindset that would make you know, someone in your shoes think that I just have to eliminate this and that and this and that whittle their diet down to five things. And then their diversity is gone. Exactly. Yeah. And I was in that space for a good while. Like we've, Amy and I both have been there where we were like on this quest to identify the food or, well, I think it was a little bit different. I, I had more of a journey of believing I have one sensitivity that has eluded me to this point and if i find you know i'm like reactive to blueberries and then all of my woes will be cured because eliminating gluten and dairy did tremendously help me so it was like i was kind of on that path versus amy you were more on the path of like you have to starve the SIBO nuke the SIBO these foods are bad for SIBO and it was more of like that kind of flavor but we both have been there where you know, we were told in some capacity that food, food is causing your symptoms. Food is the enemy in some regard. And it's freaking exhausting to be on that never ending quest or that never ending vigilance of needing to avoid all the things. And it usually, it, it, again, it's usually not going to heal you. And very often it's going to create more dysfunction and more vagal vagus nerve issues. And it's going to be a net negative result as opposed to the net positive that you're trying to get. Yeah. Agreed a hundred percent. Um, and I, I just, I know that there have been cases where someone, well, if we then go to like the, the, what is it? The, the polar opposites of like carnivore versus (laughs) vegan where, you know, yeah, yeah, some people, have gotten like they've seen resolution of their skin issues and i'm like and they're like see i was healed this is proof that this <laughs> diet works and i'm like did you yeah. ask why it worked because that actually might be more significant of a clue Bingo. to what's going on with you than anything yeah. else yeah that's <laughs> my overarching my overarching hypothesis with carnivore right now is i I would bet you five bucks that the majority of people who have responded positively to a carnivore diet probably have raging SIBO or maybe candida or some other gut thing. But like, it, it's kind of like the most extreme SIBO diet in a way. Like, okay, you could do low yeah. FODMAP and eliminate all of these plant foods. You could do SCD and eliminate a bunch of other plant foods, or you can combine the two and then also while you're at it, you know, eliminate all of the histamine food, well, minus the meat itself, but it's just like, it's like the ultimate SIBO diet where it's like, you're going to get literally zero fiber. So you don't get the flare up of the SIBO symptoms. But like, does that mean that human beings need to be eating a cardboard diet? No, you need to treat this freaking SIBO and you need to get your motility yeah. working again. You don't need to eat just like steak and salt for the rest of your life. I think that's asinine. But a lot of people get symptomatic benefit from the diet and then they're like, oh, this is it. This is the answer. And they are promoting this diet. Yeah, I actually have a client now who had SIBO and Mm -hmm. he had gone carnivore. I think he had some improvement from it, but it really didn't resolve the SIBO issue. Mm -hmm. And there was other underlying problems. Like I was like, you know. I think you might have H. pylori. Just like mm-hmm. given the picture here, I was like, I think you might have H. pylori. I actually, I don't know about your feelings because I'm not going to claim to be a SIBO expert, but I actually think that H. pylori is really often overlooked and ignored when people have SIBO. I mm-hmm. do think that's that H. pylori, and you can have, for anybody listening, you can have a test that shows up that says you don't have H. pylori and you have it. Because it's evasive. It's an evasive little sucker. And um, I have seen a lot of cases of people who have had SIBO. They get it cleared. It comes back. And I'm like, mm-hmm. did you try H. pylori? Because if you if you leave your stomach acid low and that front door is wide open yep. because you have that, that bacteria there, every time you swallow, you're swallowing more bacteria into your small yep. intestine, essentially. 
And so usually that can be also a really helpful tool is by evaluation of is H. pylori present to not just for SIBO, but for any of these skin issues to look at um, what's hijacking gut function Mm -hmm. and further digestion and absorption further down the tube, so to speak. Yeah. And I I remember too, um, one of the posts you put on Instagram, it was a while ago, but it it struck me as being really interesting. Um, You were talking about salicylate intolerance being potentially liver detox issue, Mm -hmm. which I felt was like Mm -hmm. such a unique way to, which is not what people typically are thinking of. They're thinking of, oh, I just like am intolerant to salicylate. That's my it factor. And I'm good to go. But like, looking at well why are you reacting to that same thing with like histamine too digging deeper to that Mm -hmm. but yeah i think that that's like an interesting factor too is is the whole liver situation i know that you had mentioned that multiple times in some of the conditions that you were mentioning earlier the liver being a, a major factor in the dysfunction that's present Yeah. So that came about by accident. Um, I used to, in the beginning of my practice, because it was less expensive and easier to get, I used to do a lot of organic acid testing. Mm -hmm. And what I noticed a lot of times was this overwhelm of, um, for anybody who knows like the Genova test, sometimes you'll see benzoate be really high and then hippurate be high. And so what I learned, I I got lucky. I learned from the guy that created the lab. And so the one thing that he had said was like, actually, you know, benzoates are produced by gut bugs, essentially. It's one of the waste products, unless you're consuming high, like processed foods that have benzoates in them. But generally speaking, that can come from gut bug production. And so in, so that the benzoates go to the liver and on, in the glycine pathway, they have to get converted to hippurate in order to be urinated out. And so I used to see this repeated pattern of just that whole, and even um, some of the other markers that are specific for the glycine pathway be like, you're really running through all of your glycine. That's why when people are like, can I just do collagen? I'm like, no, you actually can't just do collagen to get glycine because you have such a high need for it that I'd rather like kind of hedge my bets and put as much into the system as humanly possible to make sure that you're able to process what's going on inside Mm -hmm. your system. And so what I realized was that the gut dysbiosis, and for whatever reason, for skin issues, it's just, you're so much more reactive. You need liver support, not milk thistle, Mm -hmm. not necessarily NAC. Sometimes people need some glutathione support. Not everyone does. Um, But glycine, that glycine pathway, you absolutely do. That's the bare minimum. And so if you don't have enough glycine in your system, which is an amino acid that we do not make then you're going to have a problem because you can't package or essentially repackage up these different chemicals so that you Uh can get them out of the system. And they just kind of hang out sitting there waiting to get processed. And Uh eventually they're going to get pushed out somehow, whether it's through the urine or your skin or whatever. And so um, it was it was really through clinical experience that I realized how important that was. And then the more research I did and when I stumbled across this whole salicylate issue, I was like, um, you know, those are processed in the, with uh, that whole glycine pathway <laughs> business. Like, yeah. that's actually a sign that you don't have enough glycine and B6 and possibly B5 available to handle them. It's not a dietary intolerance. Some people do have a genetic SNP that could impair that, but that's few and far between, especially if they, you know, five years ago, they didn't. So yeah. for most people, this is incredibly helpful because if you can reintroduce salicylate foods, your life will be so much better. They're really tasty, right. wonderful, amazing foods. And it to me, it's just pointing toward a nutrient depletion issue. Hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting you say that because I had a patient that I worked with uh, briefly a few years ago. And ultimately, I ended up telling her after, I think, a couple of appointments, I said, I don't think I'm the best person to help you, as it turns out. Um, she had gut problems and some constipation and I was helping her with that. But her big thing was that she was very, very salicylate intolerant and she was intolerant to a boatload of environmental stuff, just like perfume, cleaning chemicals, you name it, anything that has a scent and she would react horribly to it. 
uh, to a point where she couldn't work. She was on disability from work. And what ended up coming to fruition is that we talked a bit about mold. And it turned out she had mold in her house. And being in North Carolina, that's not ultra uncommon because it's very humid here and we get hurricanes. But I ended up referring her to somebody in the area who specializes in mold and helping people detox from that. So it's interesting because I do see that one correlation I have that N equals one of somebody who was very salicylate intolerant. And then it turned out that a big part of her case was the mold and the need to detoxify and recover from the mold exposure. So my N equals one agrees with your clinical experience for the record. (laughs) I I know that's very profound information for you, but just like (laughs) for what it's worth. Well, I will say mold is a serious issue. Um, I don't think everybody has a mold problem. I've had some folks on the podcast that have talked about mold. And there's also, too, a difference between mold allergies, because some people are just Mm -hmm. allergic to mold, and other people have a mold issue in their house, and some people have both. (laughs) They have both things going on. Um, But I agree with you. That is certainly a factor to assess Um, If you have mold in your house, um, especially to one of the big red flags, is like you go away on vacation and everything goes away and you feel so much better. That's a red flag that there's mold in your house. Yeah, Yeah. I agree. And I will note, though, I think that that happens a little bit more like it's a clearer pattern with that. Like if you go away, you feel better. You come home, you feel like crap. I think that tends to happen more in the beginning of the progression. And then after a while, like as, and I think that's probably more so the case with people who have like an allergy or sensitivity to the mold itself versus if you're just talking about the detoxification and like the mycotoxins kind of clogging up the works. I think that as time goes on, as your body accumulates and is burdened by the mycotoxins and that need for detoxification support after potentially years of exposure, it becomes less clear and it's more muddled. And sometimes people will be like, oh, I don't think I have a mold issue in my house because like I leave on vacation and I come back and I feel the same. And I'm like, yeah, but I think you've had this for years. So for what it's worth, I think yeah. the timing no, thing does shake out I more agree. in like acute acute cases, like, yeah. you know, months or maybe years. Yeah. And, and also too, for some people, their systems can to some degree, like uh, what was explained to me by Dr. Jill Krista too, is like our genes do help determine Mm -hmm. how well some of us are able to actually process and get rid of mycotoxins. And so for somebody who might not have any genetic SNPs that impair that, they might be, um, they might might notice that situation that I was describing for a longer period of time than someone like you're saying, who also too has genetic SNPs and other implications. And also too, I mean, mold opens you up to a lot of, um, you know, H. pylori infections, parasites. I mean, it really makes it difficult to clear other things. So usually once mold is present, that's a, that's complicated. It's never just, it's usually never just mold. There's usually yeah. a whole lot of things going on and mold was mm-hmm. the starting point um, yeah. or some other things were going on and then mold made it very difficult to manage what was going on. Mm-hmm. But either way, it's usually not, it's usually not just mold. At least it's been, that's been my experience. And I, would, I think that's true of all of the root causes that we've talked about so far. Like it's usually not just that you have candida. It's not just that you have SIBO. Because again, like your body didn't just decide one day, I'm going to get candida. That's going to be a grand old time. Like there's usually some other bubbling dysfunction and quirkiness that needs some TLC. And that it's like the straw that broke the camel's back is the one that gets the most attention, but we're not paying attention, paying attention to the camel for the months or years leading up to that straw. Right. Yeah. And I do want to ask a little bit too about like some of the solutions, because I want to talk about Mm. maybe like nutrition orally. And then also, I know your um, skincare brand uh, is topical. Like there's some topical nutrients that you use, which I think is really interesting. Um, So if you want to talk a little bit about that, that'd be great. 
Yeah. So um, I will say this. There's usually no quick fix, as, as everyone's right. hearing. So right. just know that with any of these. And you can have an allergy to any of these things, too. Yeah. So if you're a very yes. allergic person, yeah. just be aware of that. Um, I really love, uh, to, if I can, to try and introduce um, some butyrate-rich foods like ghee mm -hmm. and pistachios. Everyone's like, oh, really? I can have those? I was like, yeah, as long as you don't have a dairy allergy or a nut allergy. Yeah. Um, I love ground flax seeds, except for people who are who are more on the diarrhea side yeah. <laughs> um, or who may actually have an allergy or an issue with them of some sort. Um, but I, I think the the one key is to create as varied of a diet as humanly possible um, and to do the basics very well. So drink enough water. Right. Mm -hmm. Move. Yeah. If, if sweating, for some people, sweating, especially with hives, can be a problem. Some people with eczema, sweating can make their rashes burn. Um, so you just have to know your tolerance level. But do the basics. The basics are really important. Try to get sun, except for my friends that are sun sensitive. There's a lot of accepts in yes, this. this is, yes. It makes it harder the longer you do this to be like, general blanket <laughs> statement. Um, but I will say like zinc can be really helpful. There's a lot of nutrients topically that your body can absorb. So it can actually absorb vitamin D topically. Mm -hmm. We all like, you know, I've seen pre plenty of products that have vitamin E and whatnot, but you also can topically vi um, absorb zinc. Now it will not, it will not impact the stores of zinc you have in your body because it doesn't go any deeper than the epidermis, but but the epidermis is where zinc is stored in the skin. And so that's one reason why for some people, topical zinc can be really helpful. And that was like the key ingredient, um, like the number one bestseller in my shop is the Z Plus Rebuilder. And so um, it's just been really amazing to hear people talk about how they've used that either in areas that were really red or angry. Um, and, and you don't need a whole lot either because zinc is really thick. So you, you don't want to like have a, this like white paste all over the place, but a little goes a long way. Um, and it can be very beneficial in helping to stabilize mast cells that are in the skin. Um, it also can help reduce inflammation and redness as well. It can help reduce the itchiness that you feel. Um, and, and zinc in general can, if you have appropriate levels of zinc, at least from clinical research, um, what we see is an improvement in um, the what's called trans epidural um, epidermal um, water loss. And so that means that your skin is able to hold moisture in better. So it actually d can really help improve your barrier function. It's not going to fix it. It's not like magic. There's no magic here. Um, but that has been our number one bestseller. And some people like to mix it with the um, nourish butter and really like, I don't know, they're, they're, for some reason, everybody who buys the combo is like really happy. So um, I am a big fan of zinc. I really like zinc topically, assuming you don't have an allergy to zinc. Um, but... <laughs> I know every single thing I have to be as long as you don't have an allergy yes. to it. Cause I, I work with a lot of people who are very allergic. I mm -hmm. I've worked with so many histamine overload cases at this point that anything goes, it could be sensitive to anything. Um, and so nothing shocks me at this point. And I always like to clarify now because, uh, everybody's case is different. Um, and I do think doing the diet stuff is important, but if you've whittled your way down, assuming the diet was going to be this like Pandora like, or this um, panacea of freedom for yourself to, to break free from rashes. And, and this even goes for people who got better, but can't reintroduce foods. Look underneath the surface. There are so many potential things going on. Um, and, it's just, it's crucial. I can't tell you enough because your skin is literally the check engine light of your body. I like that. I mean, so many other things are too, like pooping is a check engine light, yes. let's be honest. But I do work with a lot of folks, and I don't remember if I mentioned this, but this is another important point, is that you can have chronic skin issues and have a really messed up gut microbiome and have no gut symptoms at all. So it is possible to have to like poop like a champ you're doing great nothing you know nothing going on with gas or yeah. bloating or belching or any of that 
but you could have a parasite. You could have dysbiosis that for whatever reason only shows its rears its ugly head essentially on the skin, the level of the skin. Um, and I've had that happen with multiple clients. Um, one of my clients, he had three separate parasites, three separate parasites, H, high H. pylori, all sorts of other opportunistic bacteria, and he has never had any GI issues at all. Mm. And so one of my big, big things, and I don't believe that every single person has parasites. Some people do, um, but my big thing now is to really try to create a body of work that will show that you can have my gut microbiome on imbalances that are driving these issues they're not the only issue and there's usually you know as you both have even said usually there's impacts to nutrient status and all sorts of other things um but you have you've got to look in the microbiome um, especially when your doctor is literally like, I don't know, maybe it's genetic. Like Shrug. that's where you need to look. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's wild that that's the solution, I guess, when there's not nothing else that they could look, look at, I guess it's just genetic. Um, it's wild that that happens, but I, a few other questions. I know I've heard you talk about coconut oil. I know it's a trend that's that's all the rage these days is coconut oil on the skin. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. I would say if you have eczema, don't do it. If you have rosacea, mm-hmm. don't do it. If you have psoriasis, you could try it. It might help. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I what I have just noticed to 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 go slightly back to that allergic piece is yeah. that I think there is an increasing number of allergies to coconut because it is so ubiquitous now in cooking and in skincare that I have seen a really big rise in people who are discovering that some of their eczema was actually being driven by coconut oil application. So mm. I understand you read it online. <laughs> I understand that you read it on a probably a really big paleo website. It does not make it true. <laughs> I think they it, will it, give anybody a blog. Yes. I know, because I have one. I know. <laughs> and then I also was curious too, I've seen more topical stuff trying to incorporate things like probiotics within the products. Again, I don't know much about that. I was just curious if you had any opinions or like ideas or if you've tried any of these stuff, uh, any of the topical probiotics out with clients, if that's anything that's effective. I haven't done much exploring into the area. So, okay, so I'm going to preface this by saying I am not a formulation expert (laughs) by any stretch of the imagination, but this has been my experience. Um, I don't think that certain... So I I like mother dirt, but I'm just going to tell you that if you have active rashes, mother dirt spray will make it worse. Mm. That's just been like across the board, pretty much at what people have written me and told me. Mm. So I would say don't apply that on active rashes. Um, there is one product called Indigo Calm Balm. That does have probiotics in it. And that I've actually had a lot of great feedback on from clients cool. that that's been helpful. As far as the other stuff on the market, um, the the better person to probably ask that of would be Rachel Pontillo. I know right now the challenge is, and, and there's also, I don't know what's going to happen in that industry because there have been companies in, I think the UK, one company got in trouble for making claims about prebiotics and probiotics on a label. And it was a really big company. And then Mm -hmm. there was another company recently here in the U S that also got in trouble. Mm -hmm. I think that we may be headed with the probiotic thing down a slippery slope toward it possibly being more regulated. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also too, depending on what's in the formulation, you you might not have any bacteria left by the, that are are alive by the time you actually have the product in your hands. Um, again, Rachel would be a much better person to explain that than me. Um, but 
you know, you can try topically applying probiotics like from a capsule to your skin. I would apply some like, um, you know, whatever type of favorite oil or coconut oil moisturizer, <laughs> not, not coconut oil, um, to your skin. I could resist. Co- so coconut oil is really antimicrobial. So if yeah. you're already having a dysbiosis problem, it's probably going to make it worse. That's one reason why, aside from, you know, it's very thick. It can't be absorbed through the skin. The molecules are too large. But um, you can do light sprinkles of like megasporbiotic on the skin. So for some people, that has been helpful. You could try other probiotics. But the a lot of the bugs that live on the skin are quite different than the ones right. that live in the GI mm-hmm. tract. Um, but... I do know the Bacillus subtilis, um, at least from a, a gut usage perspective, can help crowd out Staph aureus. And Staph aureus are, is always a concern that like a skin infection could be Staph aureus. So, but again, I can't ever advise you to apply anything to an infection or anything like that. Right. Um, but I would encourage each and every person to understand what the symptoms of an infection are, because I've also seen... An excessive number of people who don't want to go to the doctors, they get really frustrated and they keep thinking they're just in a flare and they're applying all these creams and um, natural oils and essential oils. And in reality, they had like either a staph infection, a strep mm-hmm. infection or some some other type of skin infection that required medical treatment. And they suffer an exorbitant period of time mm-hmm. that's unnecessary because they didn't want to get it checked. And it uh, just a simple skin culture will tell you a lot about what's going on if you have like redness, really bad itching, burning, especially p- any type of pain. Um, I would tell you if you have kind of that like the, that hallmark, if especially and if it's oozing, um, go and get checked for a skin infection. Yeah, that's such great advice. Um, all right, I know we're we're coming up on time. Uh, is there any other? topics or anything in particular you want to wrap up with jennifer um i would just say that um there, i mean there's so many things i could talk about i mean i literally have right. like almost 200 episodes of my <laughs> podcast and yes. there's so much to choose from yes um I, I think the the best thing i would say is if somebody's listening to this and they're really struggling like there there is a lot more information and especially like condition specific information over on the healthy skin show and you can search you don't have to listen to the podcast in sequential order you could hop to whatever um episodes are most interest of a most interest to you you could also type in what skin issue you have into the search and all of those episodes will show up for you sometimes things are more general because there can be overlap I know that sounds super weird because I was like no I have this type of egg I'm numular eczema what is good yeah. for <laughs> numular eczema and I'm like that might be important to like a little tiny degree, but what's really more important is your overall picture. And I think we sometimes get too honed in on what the diagnosis is Hmm. instead of saying, okay, what are the symptoms of the skin that you have going on specific to you? What's your diagnosis and what's going on everywhere else? And that's what I'm most interested in is looking at that fuller, broader picture to really understand what's going on because why exactly the skin, like people have asked me, why do I have eczema or why do I have psoriasis? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know the exact reason why. I mean, we know that inflammation, these are inflammatory driven processes, right? We have antibiotics that are used to help with rosacea, which dermatologists argue that it's used for their anti-inflammatory impacts. Okay. Okay. We could somewhat agree with that, but we all know here (laughs) That it Bless their the microbiome. Yeah. But then you look at like eczema, for example, and, and even psoriasis. When you look at the biologic drugs, those are impacting inflammatory pathways. That's all they do is they shut off inflammation pathways. So we know for sure, because biologic drugs for some people do work really, really well, mm-hmm. that there is inflammation being generated. And a lot of times it could be partially in the at the level of the skin, but there's something going on underneath. And that's what we have to figure out is where is that inflammation being generated internally? And that if you're if you're so dedicated and interested to understand what your why whys are, why is this happening? What's causing this? What's driving it? That's what you need to to start asking is what's going on internally that's generating so much inflammation that my check engine light is like screaming at me. 
Yeah. And that will actually provide you a lot more answers. And and for anybody who's looking for help, like I do have that skin rash root cause finder. That's like a yes. booklet you can go through We're and check link off. To that. Yeah. And that can be really helpful for people to start understanding how to piece this together. Because a lot of times you, everybody's like, oh, it must be my gut. I'm like, well, that's a piece. Yeah, that's a piece. You know, it could be the trauma. It could be the stress. It could it legit could be mold. It could be environmental toxins as well. You could have this overlapping, complicated picture, which a lot of chronic cases are. And so when we get out of the tunnel vision and just say, you know what, I'm just going to broadly open myself up to what could potentially be going on here and know that N equals one. I am unique. I need to look at what my unique picture is. That will really help provide you more answers and solutions. Um, If you put your eggs in one boat that one thing's going to fix you, um, I think that's where we get ourselves into trouble. And I, I would hate to see somebody end up like feeling so depressed and defeated because they think they did all the things. Every right. person that's told me they did all the things, I'm like, you haven't done all the things. You just <laughs> did all the things you knew. None about. of us have and none of us can. For True. That right. Right. Yeah. So I think, again, check out your website, skinterrupt.com, right? And then mm-hmm. your skincare line is quellshop.com Quell shop. Quell <laughs> okay I'm just trying to make sure I'm pronouncing this right yep. and then of course the healthy skin show um, is such a great resource and then we will link to the the root cause finder for the rashes um, freebie that you got that you have and we will put, put that as a link when we make this public when we make this public when we release this and launch this out awesome. to the world Woo-hoo. um and then, yeah, we're so happy you were able to come on. And I will go ahead and take us out, Nikki. I know we were like, oh, you're going to take us out. I'll, you I'll got it. You out. got it, darling. I'm, you do I'm it. I'm here now. We're going to do it. I'm so um, proud. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, but we're so happy you, were, you came on because I think this is such an important conversation. And I, I love that you're very in line with us about, you know, having a healthy relationship with food is very important. Yes, you might have some some triggers that will that will be at play and some skin stuff, but it's not the end all be all and you still need to be nourished to to get well. And I think that everyone that's struggling out there with skin issues would really benefit from this episode and then also going and checking out all your awesome resources. So well, thanks thank so you. much. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was such an honor to be here with both of you. And, you know, I I know, too, because there's so much of a connection between this whole, these two worlds yeah. that, um, you know, either way, it's this is a really great resource. And, and your podcast, as well, is a really great resource and asset to people who are struggling and looking for answers. So thank you so much. It's been an honor to be here. Awesome. Well, maybe we'll have you back at some point. That would be really okay. fun. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, as usual, you guys can find us where you listen to podcasts at IBS Freedom Podcast. Um, we have Instagram at ibs.pod or ibs.freedom.podcast. And then our email is ibs.freedom.pod at gmail.com if you want to email us your questions. That may be incorrect. Wait, wait. Oh. (laughs) Oh, that. I forget it. Maybe you should have taken us Um, out. You have a whole spiel. Yeah, that's all right. That's all right, darling. It's uh, the email is ibsfreedompod at gmail.com, but there's no dots. That's only in the Instagram handle that we have. Um, And that We'll use those for the Q and A. So yes. uh, we will yes. we'll do Q and As every now and then. And then, as always, if you can share this episode with whoever you think would benefit, or if you want to pop this into one of those skin groups or SIBO groups or yes. IBS groups, so that other people can benefit from this information and learn about Jennifer and what she does, that would be just so deeply appreciated. Um, and now I think now I think that's a wrap. Yes. We'll see you next time, I guess. Adios. Bye.